Welcome everyone to New South Wales DPI Dairies webinar number 17, Health Disorders and Behaviour of Cows in Automatic Milking Systems. My name is Nicholas Lyons. I'm a Development Officer Dairy with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, but this presentation today is not about me. Please let me introduce, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Megan King to all of you today. Megan grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, She's been living in Ontario, Canada since 2007. Megan holds a Bachelor in Environmental Biology from Queen's University, a Master's in Animal Behavior and Welfare from the University of Guelph, where she studied the timing of fresh feed delivery relative to milking time and the impacts that has on behavior and productivity. In 2017, Megan finished her PhD that was entitled Lameness and Health Disorders, in cows milked in automated systems. Megan there looked at factors affecting milking activity and cow behavior in robotic milking, and she was working under the supervision of Dr. Trevor DeVries. Megan has at least nine papers published, eight of them in the Journal of Dairy Science, one of them in the Frontiers of Vet Science. She, she, she has also recently completed a book chapter for Temple Grandin's new livestock handling and transport book that is titled Robotic Milking of Dairy Cows, Behavior and Welfare. Megan is now a postdoc fellow at the University of Guelph. She does a lot of collaborations to create and validate illness detection models, and she's been working on a survey of more than 200 robotic farms in Canada. Megan and I met as part of a conference in the U.S. back in June, the International Precision Dairy Conference, and then the American Dairy Association meeting, where Megan presented a lot of her research she's been doing, and I thought it was a fantastic opportunity to share a lot of her findings and research with all of you today. So, Megan, it is a real pleasure to have you with all of us today. I thank you in advance for your time and willingness to accept this invitation. And the stage is all yours. I'll share presenter rights with you. All right. Thank you, Nico. And thank you, everyone, for signing up here today. I'm really excited to present some of this research with you. Let's see. Can you see my screen properly? Yes. OK, perfect. So here we have a picture uh, to start off with of what a common farm looks like in Canada. Um, and I should have added to my bio, I actually did live in Brisbane for four whole months. So I, I kind of have an idea of Australian temperatures and that type of thing. So here we have a Canadian uh, robot dairy farm. And you can see here it's the sand freestall, which is kind of your gold standard for cow comfort. Um, you'll also see often in Canada our farms are slightly understocked and this is kind of due to our supply management which we do love but um, it does mean that the newer farms which we're are hoping to grow just have to grow a bit more slowly. Uh, you can also see that there's two robot rooms which is the um, the red bar across there so there's four robots in total for this farm uh, the cows on each side uh, milk facing away from us. They can either get sorted uh, back to a fresh cow pack uh, or sorted to a pen of stalls for treatment cows or the cows kind of uh, make a 90 degree turn towards the center. Uh, they go through a grazeway which sorts them and then they pop out towards us and um, that's where they've got their foot bath. So that's, that's something that we, we commonly see in Canada. Um, so today's talk is all about these single box robotic milking systems. I'm not going to be talking at all about the, you know, rotary robot parlors or anything like that. Um, and so uh, one thing to think about is the fact that we're getting cows to visit the robot because they want to. They're getting their supplemental feed. And that is their main driver to go visit the robot. It's not actually their desire to be milked or the utter pressure. So these robots are becoming quite popular worldwide, and it's kind of hard to get a good number on this, but we do know that it's over 30,000 herds worldwide. In Canada, it's over 1,000 herds. 
the States, it's slowly catching up uh, over 500. And in Australia, you guys are at 45 and counting. And part of the reason it's hard to get a good number on this is because, uh, unfortunately, I guess some of these farms are going off of their dairy herd improvement milk recording programs uh, just because they have so much data now on their own that they don't really need DHI, but it does make it a bit harder to get some of these estimates. So here's a graph just to show you kind of where I'm at from the rest of the world. Uh, in terms of percentage of farms in different countries that use robots, they're pretty huge in the Nordic countries and in the Netherlands. Um, and then Canada is down here where you can see we're at about 10% as of 2018. And I'm sorry for you Australians, but you didn't make it on the graph. But here you are sitting at about 1% of farms using robots. Um, this next figure here shows how big these farms are. So just to give you an idea, Australians are uh, milking on average 274 cows per farm. Whereas in Canada, I'm used to something more around 91 cows per farm. So definitely slightly smaller. And I realize that we are more intensive here, but um, if you are milking cows indoors, I don't think it really matters in this case how big the farm is. Um, so here's an example here. You've got you know, a pen and you're never gonna really have more than one to three robots per pen anyways. And then the way people scale that up is to have, let's say, um, four in a module. You can have these multiple modules and um, they form basically mini farms within one ginormous farm. So you can scale that up to 16 robots. I've seen plans for 64 robots. So um, still you are managing individual cows as units themselves and then you know, a pen of anywhere from 60 to 180 cows. So today what I want to go through, and I hope you find it all as exciting as I do, we're going to talk about what sensors and data are available to us. Uh, I want to talk about why it's important to consider mild lameness or subclinical ketosis, and then which data are useful to help with illness detection. And then finally, what we can improve on and do better. So to start, I think it's important to remind ourselves why we use technology. Um, the whole point of robots and sensors is to make our lives better. So uh, in general, you know, we have happier farmers and happier cows with these systems. Um, farmers are reporting less stress and reduced labor requirements. They do have more flexibility in their day now. So what's really great is people are getting to eat meals with their family and put their kids on the bus for breakfast, uh, after breakfast. Um, and then they are reporting better quality of life. And overall, we're seeing improvements in efficiency. From the cow side, um, the robot does decrease stress. Um, you know, with all this technology, we should see more health, healthy cows and more comfortable cows. And part of that is their ability to make choices in their day about when they want to be milked and when they want to eat. Um, and so they should also have a better quality of life. And if they're healthier, they should be more productive and therefore more efficient. And so I'm not going to talk too much more about this today, but I'm really excited about a side project I'm working on where so far 30 people have done surveys for me telling me about their their mental health and their stress. And I'm gonna link that to their cow health data to see if there's some sort of relationship going on between, you know, what's the welfare of the people compared to the welfare of their cows. Because I really do think that they are connected in some ways. So other benefits to robots include that behavioral freedom I mentioned. So they do get to decide when they wanna be milked. And not only is that good for the cow in terms of meeting her own individual needs, but it's also kind of good for public perception, I think. Um, the public would like to know that cows kind of get to make their own decisions in a day. The robots are great too because they're very consistent 
when they milk, they don't ever have bad days. They prep cows the exact same way every time and perform all the milking tasks the same. So that's good for the cow in terms of the consistency and the experience, but it can also be good for udder health. And robots give us the opportunity to manage cows individually instead of just in a big group. So yes, everyone's eating the same, uh, usually partial mixed ration in a bunk or grazing on pasture, but you can manage them individually in terms of how much you're milking them. So um, you can obviously milk a, a fresh cow more often, up to peak lactation. This nicely follows their lactation curve. And then you can actually taper it off towards dry off, which is great because um, cows being dried off by more than about 20 uh, kilos in a day, um, those cows are shown to have some physiological stress in their udder. So if you taper off their milking frequency, there's not so much milk being produced the day you dry them off. And also their supplemental feed allowance. So again, you can use the feed tables to kind of mirror what the cow is producing, give them more feed up until peak lactation. And again, um, bring that down towards later lactation and taper it off so that the cow can almost dry herself off. So it's not just the type of feed, uh, the amount of feed, it's also the type. So you can um, give solids in the, in the robot or uh, liquid feed. Uh, a lot of Canadians also do their own, um, their own crops so they're not buying in pellets. Um, so things like soybeans or high moisture corn. So all these benefits, um, it's definitely a new way of managing cows now. So there is a lot of technology. And with that, there's a ton of data. And so having so much data is both a benefit and a challenge, I figure, uh, because it can also be a bit overwhelming and, and you wanna make sure you're making the best decision you can based on what's available to you. Uh, with robots, there is also that um, lost contact time when you're pushing cows to the parlor to be milked um, and you're not um, prepping cows and looking at milk quality yourself, you're now relying on data to do this. And it has been mentioned that potentially robots aren't as good at teat cleaning um, because they don't yet have eyes. I think they might someday. Um, and they can't really determine which cow has got a more dirty udder and needs a bit more cleaning. And then another big challenge is making sure cows are voluntarily visiting the robot. So if they're not going in on their own, we have to come in and fetch them. And this is especially important if you have a free cow traffic system um, where you know cows have free, free for all throughout the barn or there's no selection gates guiding them from different areas of the barn or pasture. Uh, and I do love free traffic in that sense that it um, gives cows more options and it is much better for their feeding behavior and rumination behavior. Um, so they're not like slug feeding by the time they do get to the bunk. But it just means that you have to really be on top of keeping cows motivated and healthy to visit the robot. And so a big thing that um, affects how much they want to visit the robot is how healthy they are. So obviously clinical serious health disorders are going to limit how much they want to visit the robot. But it's not just those serious things, it's also subclinical ketosis, which I'll show you later, um, impacts production. And it may actually be that subclinical ketosis is more prevalent for robotic herd. And this could be due to the way we feed cows um, with uh, the pellet in the robot, or it could be due to the fact that we're milking more often. Also, it's important to look at things like moderate lameness, where cows have a mild limb. It doesn't look extremely bad, but it turns out that a quarter of cows in herds do have moderate lameness. And I'll show you later that this really impacts their ability to visit the robot and their production. So how can we improve cow health? Obviously prevention is the best place to start. So keeping cows clean and dry so that their udders are, are clean, their feet are clean, um, and just keeping them generally comfortable. But of course, uh, nothing's ever perfect. And so if that does fail, it is important to focus on early identification 
and early treatment of sick cows. And so some of the data we can use to identify illness sooner looks at the milk itself, so characteristics about the milk, and also the cow herself. So what is she doing? So more specifically, uh, some of the data that's available with milking robots, as I'm sure you all know, we've got uh, milk data like how much milk, what's the temperature, what's the conductivity. Also things like how often they're milking or how long it's been between milkings. Failed milkings are often uh, a sign of mastitis. And if you have this magical blue box called herd navigator, you would have um, added measures of lactate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme that's active if you have mastitis, uh, milk BHB, which indicates ketosis, and progesterone for heat and pregnancy detection. So that's data about the milk. We also have data about the cow and her behavior. So some people have the low cells, which look at the cow's body weight, and others have these collars, which um, are basically the SCR collar. It's commonly sold with Laley robots, but you can definitely put in uh, rumination collars with any brand of robot. And um, that looks at how much time the cow is spent ruminating and how much uh, activity she's performing. So when you put that all together and you're looking at the software on the farm computer, it can look something like this. So if you're dealing with Laley, there's a milk attention setting for help alert and HR attention, which means heat rumination attention. So just as an example, um, if a cow is deviating in her milk yield by more than four kilos in a day or 20%, uh, if her conductivity changes by more than 20% or the temperature by more than 2%, the cow gets flagged that there's potentially something wrong and she's brought up on a, a sick cow list. Uh, and same with rumination, if it drops by more than 40 minutes, she'll be flagged. Um, and you can see Laley's got their default settings and then the farmer or the advisor can go in and modify that. Um, and so I wanted to kind of research what should these values be. And then also if you have a uh, DLaVal robot, you might be familiar with this MDI index, the uh, mastitis detection index. And so that puts a bunch of variables together and comes up kind of with a probability of the cow having mastitis. So there's definitely a lot out there, um, but I want to make sure that people are using data to make informed and timely decisions um, that can help improve their cow's health and their production. So how can we do this? Today, I'm going to run through um, basically the main lessons I've learned from the last five years of going to robot farms across Canada and reading hundreds of papers, which lucky for you, you do not need to read um, because I've tried my best to sum it up here. So we're gonna talk a bit about lameness, then we're gonna go into ketosis and how important it is to look at rumination data. Also talk about how illnesses respond differently, other things that we can consider in our models, and finally, what can we do better? So the first thing I've learned from my research is that the herd prevalence of lameness is related to lower milk production. So if you think of a really lame cow, you know that she probably has lost some production because of that, but this isn't just each cow individually. If you think on the whole, how many lame cows does that farm have? If they have a lot of lame cows, they're actually gonna have lower production compared to other farms who have less overall lameness. So um, the way that lameness reduces herd productivity, uh, the way I studied this was looking at 40 farms in Canada and I gate scored cows to find that on average, 26% of the cows in each herd were lame meaning that a quarter of the cows had a slight limp or worse than that. But the good news here is that only 2.2% of cows were actually worse than that. So um, if you look at the way cows walk, 
if she's limping and also throws her head up and down with each step, that is a severely lame cow. And for the most part, actually, farmers are really keeping on top of this and, and treating those cows. So even within that severe lameness prevalence, which there's not a ton of cows that are severely lame, even so, I found that as the herd prevalence of lameness increased, you did see effects on productivity. So as an example, let's say you double that herd level lameness. And so you have two robots, you have 120 cows. Instead of having three cows that are severely lame, there's six cows that are severely lame. The amount that you would see the milk yield drop per cow is 0.7 kilos per day. And the amount that you would see drop per robot is 39 kilos per day. So on the whole, it's not just each lame cow herself that has less production, the herd as a whole will have lower production. So I also learned that even moderate lameness can impair cow performance. So um, this is actually most of the cows, right? Um, most of the cows just had a mild limp and even so, they, have, where they were more likely to be fetched or brought to the robot. They produced less milk each day. They had fewer milkings each day and they spent more time lying down. And that is when I'm comparing a lame cow to a sound healthy cow. But we also see some changes within the lame cows over time. So this is a research herd where 14 cows had a corrective hoof trim on the far right, which would be kind of day zero when she got diagnosed. And on average, I looked at what was happening to these cows in the two weeks leading up to their corrective hoof trim. And I saw that over time, the rumination was slowly declining and their milking frequency was slowly declining. And I'm not crazy, I'm not the only one that's found this, um, all this other research in conventional herds has also found lower milk yield, uh, less time spent walking, lower activity in general, or maybe cows are actually more active overnight compared to the daytime. Cows generally ruminate less, or the studies found that there's no change for those lame cows or no difference from what a sound cow was doing. And some people have also looked at specifically rumination time overnight. So also looking at um, robot herds specifically, researchers have found that lameness causes milk yield to go down, milking frequency to go down, and also voluntary milking frequency to go down. So the less cows are going to the robot on their own, the more uh, farmers are gonna have to fetch them. Uh, refusals also went down, so that's when you have um, a cow visiting the robot but she doesn't have her milking permission yet. And activity goes down. So overall it might go down, or again, maybe cows are actually more active overnight relative to the daytime, specifically maybe early morning and evening, or maybe it's just generally unstable. And again, rumination time has been seen to go down for lean cows, or there's no change in different studies. So overall, there are definite um, negative effects of lameness, even just mild, moderate limp, and not severe cases. So the next thing here to look at was subclinical ketosis. And I found uh, that not only does it lower milk yield and frequency, we also see cows ruminating less. So here is um, the research herd that had 19 cows with ketosis. And basically in the week leading up to the day we detected it, which would be the far right, you see that the rumination time is dropping and so is the milk yield. So rumination time declines as does milk yield. Then I thought, what if we compare cows with ketosis to other cows, whether they're healthy, or whether they have ketosis and some other health disorder. So uh, essentially what I'm looking at here is the first three weeks of lactation from nine different farms. And I'm looking at the milk yield of cows who only had subclinical ketosis, which is the orange line. And they actually had the highest milk yield 
which does make sense because having high milk yield is going to put you at risk for ketosis. Uh, then you have the healthy cows who had nothing wrong with them. And then the lowest milk yield in the first three weeks in lactation are actually the cows who have another or disorder besides ketosis or they have ketosis and another health disorder. I also looked at how much these cows were ruminating and generally uh, they were ruminating about the same amount except the group with ketosis and another health disorder who really had the lowest rumination time. And generally rumination is a proxy for how much feed the cow is consuming, uh, which we don't have data from bunk intake, but we do know how much pellet they were eating in the robot. And so what I found was, regardless of how much cows were producing during these first three weeks of their lactation, all the cows were getting the same amount of supplemental feed. So then I thought to look at how much are they actually producing relative to what they're consuming in the robot. And it's no wonder that the high producing cows got subclinical ketosis and then got even more sick with another disorder. So again, we're looking at the first three weeks of these cows lactations and how much milk a cow is producing relative to what she's eating in the robot. And cows with subclinical ketosis had such a high production right off the bat relative to what they were consuming. Then the cows who had only subclinical ketosis, they're doing all right, um, still producing quite well, but the cows who got another disorder, their milk production dropped. If you look at how much a cow is producing relative to how much she's ruminating, um, that's kind of, to me, a way of looking at the output of what she's producing relative to her input of what she's eating. Um, we can see that the cows with ketosis, again, had really high amounts of milk produced relative to their rumination. So um, a cow with only ketosis was quite high to start with. And um, the cows that had ketosis and another health disorder, it starts pretty high. They're producing a lot of milk. They're really not ruminating that, that much. And then you can see this, this fight here because their rumination time really dropped and they're just producing so much compared to what they're ruminating. So it's no wonder that the high producing cows are getting sick. And I think part of the reason we see this is because farmers aren't necessarily taking advantage of what their feed tables can provide. So you can offer your pellet in the robot based on how much milk the cow is producing. And most times people will keep this just based on days in milk. And so you can see that up until 20 days in milk, the cow is getting a set amount of pellet only based on her days in milk. But in this case, starting uh, 21 days in milk, the cow is now fed more pellet based on how much she's producing. And so some farms start ahead about 20 days in milk, which is after the graphs I just showed. I was showing the first three weeks of lactation, but some people don't even start feeding based on the milk yield up until 60 days in milk. So since I've done this project, I've noticed farmers now starting to do this a bit earlier, say uh, 14 days in milk, they're starting to feed based on production. And I know you don't wanna do that in the first week of lactation just because the milk yield is going to be quite variable and you don't wanna necessarily be feeding based off of that. But what people are doing, and it seems to be working well, basically you can push this up to about 10 to 14 days of milk, start feeding more pellet based on higher production. So next, I found that when I looked at what cows were doing before they got diagnosed with illness, I saw that their rumination time was actually dropping a day or more before their milk yield was dropping. So I will show you again some graphs here just to show that, for example, before DA, um, this is starting 12 days before they're diagnosed and over time towards the day they're diagnosed, which would be the far right, you see that the cows had their rumination time start to drop off 
actually four days before the milk field. So uh, eight days before diagnosis, the cow's rumination started to go down. Four days later, the milk field actually started to go down. And this is also um, how cows responded to pneumonia. So rumination time started to significantly decline before one day before the milk field. And again, with subclinical ketosis, it doesn't look as severe of a drop, but it is still statistical, and the cow's rumination starts to drop off a day before her milk field. And I know this isn't rocket science, but it does make sense that the cow's behavior is going to change before her production. So obviously a cow has to go off feed and stop ruminating before her milk field is going to drop. And so why aren't we looking at this data as an earlier indicator of illness? So next I want to show that there might be different ways that illnesses respond different from each other. And so maybe we can look at the data and actually get an idea of what type of illness that cow may have. So what I found um, is essentially there was differences between those really acute illnesses that the cow had a really rapid onset of her symptoms. And so that would be something like a DA, like mastitis, like pneumonia. And that is something that hits really hard, really quickly. But then if you compare that to a, a more chronic illness that a cow might have, which is like a state that the cow slowly enters into, it makes sense that something like subclinical ketosis or lameness is a state that the cow slowly enters into. So um, here I'll show you just il different illnesses each at a time and kind of show you what you see in the data. So we'll start with the DA. I know it's overwhelming, but we're not really going to get too much into it. Um, what we see here is that DA acts as an acute, rapid onset type of illness. So the cows that had a DA are shown in blue, and it's showing what's happening to their milk yield and their rumination time and their activity, all leading up in the two weeks before they were diagnosed. And then I matched them to some healthy cows just to see what would a healthy cow be doing at that point. And so what we see is that the, the blue stars show basically there's a really significant or start drop in the milk yield. So 12 days before the GA is diagnosed, the milk yield starts to decline. Rumination time also 12 days before and activity six days before even milk temperature really has a, a sharp drop off. And we see something similar with mastitis. So our mastitis cows are in red and I've compared them to healthy cows. But even if you look within the mastitis cows, there's a really obvious change that occurs pretty much seven days for milk field, eight days for the rumination of the cow. If you look down to the milking frequency, that's eight days before diagnosis, and there's a really sharp change in the, the data that we see. On the bottom right, we have maximum conductivity. So basically of the cows, three, hopefully four quarters, what was the highest conductivity measurement? And oftentimes people will be using this to detect mastitis. And I saw that already 12 days before mastitis was diagnosed, those cows had increased milk conductivity. So those are the really acute illnesses where you see a really obvious change in the data. But if you look at something like ketosis, it's not so obvious. So ketosis is more of a metabolic state that slowly sets in. And as you can see here, there are differences between the sick and healthy cows, but there isn't really an obvious day where the milk or rumination changes for the sick cows. So it's really just we see differences from the healthy group. And the same thing, thing here with lameness. So again, lameness wouldn't normally just set in overnight. It, it's generally a soul ulcer that develops over time. And so 
the lameness is a bit of a state that the cow enters into. You don't see an obvious day that the data would change, but you do see that it would be different than what a healthy cow would be. So I know that was a lot of graphs, but I just wanted to kind of show you what I was talking about. And I thought we'd take a break with um, a beautiful picture from Canada in January and talk about what are the other things to consider when thinking about cow data and how that can show the health status. So the first obvious thing would be actually the environment data. So middle of winter, the cow is not heat stressed, but obviously in the middle of summer or Australian or Californian conditions, I think it is important to look at what's the temperature, what's the humidity, because that's clearly going to have an effect on feed intake, on rumination, and on milk yield. I also think it's really important and basic to just think about how many days of milk is the cow. So if she is a fresh cow, she's supposed to be ramping up her production and ramping up her rumination on the way to peak lactation. So even if she's leveling off, that should flag that there's a potential issue. And I don't think that the same settings should be used to flag a fresh cow that would be used to flag a late lactation cow. Also, how many lactations is the cow? So the lactation curve, you would expect it to look different for a first calf heifer compared to a older cow. And so I do think that needs to be considered when you're looking at the cow data. And then finally, what are her healthy first mates doing? So not just what are the changes she's showing from herself yesterday, but what is she doing relative to another healthy first calf heifer who's eating the same thing, living in the same housing conditions, and basically like a, a perfect comparison to see what that cow should be doing. So essentially, no matter how you slice it, all of this research has looked at either comparing a sick and a healthy cow, or they've looked within the sick cows, uh, kind of changes within the cow leading up to the day something was diagnosed, or researchers have induced mastitis or acidosis and looked at changes in the data. And so it doesn't matter what they've looked at, most of them have found Overall, milk yield is going down, activity is going down, rumination time is going down, milk conductivity increases, and body weight decreases. But it's not totally simple because it can depend on what type of illness the cow has, what is the parity of the cow, and whether you're looking at pre calving dry cow data or post calving fresh cow data. And I just love these cute little uh, icons here because on the right, you can see the researcher with the cute little dog. And that is definitely me when I go to farms, um, just always having help trying to take our blood samples. So, so far we've talked about what the differences between sick and healthy cows, but some people have actually gone a step further and made these illness detection models. So overall, it can be for separate illnesses like DA, ketosis, indigestion, mastitis, metritis, and lameness. Uh, or sometimes it's kind of a group here and there of different types of illness. But overall, this is what people have looked at. And I know someone asked ahead of the webinar, what can we look at besides hours since the last milking. So if you're super keen and you want to make your own models or just play around with your own farms data, you can obviously look at rumination time. You can look at activity or walking speed, any type of data you get from your pedometers, obviously milk yield, but also milk slope. So that's kind of the daily change in milk. On top of that, you can look at variation within the day. So milk yield within the day, 
conductivity within the day, look at differences between milkings for that cow, and body weight. So the absolute value, or you can look at what does she weigh now relative to what she weighed at calving. Some people look at milk flow rate or teat cup attachment speed. And believe it or not, those researchers were predicting lameness, not mastitis. Uh, you can look at the line behavior of the cow, look at how many times she gets, gets up and down in a day. And finally, some researchers look at concentrate leftovers. So in that case, it was the more leftovers there was in the feed table, uh, the more, uh, more likely the cow would be to be. So, um, I'm not going to say how accurate those models are because people are always saying, you know, it's 95% accurate. But the problem is that there's a ton of room for improvement and that, not to pick on those researchers, but they really were excluding a lot of important things. So what they did is they only looked at one illness at a time or they would exclude a cow that had multiple types of illness. They'd exclude a cow who had a moderate case of illness or to just completely exclude the fresh cows, which are those who are at the highest risk of getting health disorders. Some people don't consider what should a healthy cow be doing. Sometimes they're only looking at a single farm worth of data. So does it necessarily work on another farm in a completely different country? Sometimes they don't look at a lot of predictor variables. So they don't look at a lot of data. They might look at only milk and not rumination or nothing besides that. And so some of them, as a result, have poor performance of the model, which is low sensitivity or specificity. And finally, it just seems that sometimes the settings or the thresholds are kind of manually or arbitrarily selected. So that's why we figured we could let a machine do it better. So I'm now working with some other researchers to develop illness detection algorithms, algorithms using machine learning. And so it's not gonna get too heavy, I promise, but the general idea is that we're using data collected by the robot, by the cow behavior monitors, and we're training an artificial brain or an artificial neural network to predict how probable is it that a cow has a disease. And so thank goodness to my collaborators who are very tech savvy, um, who are in Toronto or Guelph or Calgary. And together what we're doing is using deep learning to make some new algorithm. So everyone's familiar with artificial intelligence, which is using a, tech, a technique that creates an artificial brain or it mimics the human brain or human behavior. A subset of that is what people call machine learning, and that is where you're using a machine or a computer to make some sort of prediction, but it can improve on its predictions over time with experience. Then a subset of that is what's called deep learning, and the difference there is that you're making these predictions and you can improve them over time, but each time you make a prediction, there's multiple layers of data processing and decisions being made. So essentially, you're mapping really complicated relationships that aren't necessarily linear between different predictor variables, which is something like milk yield or temperature or milking interval. And that is going into the model and putting it all together and coming up with some sort of outcome of interest. So the output of the model in this case is how probable is it that a cow has mastitis? So this here is Herman Barkema, the same guy that left the Australians out of that first, first graph. And here, essentially what he would be doing in this case is taking into account, I know her milk yield is down. I know it's been a while since her last milking, but it's also been really hot since yesterday. And I remember I locked her up an hour this morning. So putting all of that information together and coming up with how probable is it that she has mastitis. 
So I'm picking on Herman today, but it's a little bit more complicated than his brain because it's now having multiple layers of, of hidden layers of data processing. And so it's very complicated in the way that it processes the data to get that probability. So these artificial neural networks that we're using are called recurrent because they're looking at data over time and they're looking at patterns in the cow's data and basically seeing what is out of the ordinary and what's a bit of an anomaly. And so every prediction that it's making isn't just based on what information does it currently have available. It's also remembering all of the predictions that it's made in the past and how, how um, accurate were those predictions. So if it did a bad job, it would forget that. And if it did a good job, it will keep that information and keep using it. So in this case, it's like Herman thinking, last time this happened, um, I know it's because I changed the concentrate. I also know that this cow had staph last month. And so putting that information all together, I should really go and check if she has methane. So what our model is doing is coming up with this disease probability index, just to sound fancy. And essentially, we're looking at um, over, over time, so her days in milk. Um, here's a healthy cow who actually has this low probability of sickness. And so the blue line is the prediction of the model. And the blue line is pretty much on the orange, so the model is doing a good job of predicting. But if we look at what happens to a sick cow, you can see that her actual probability in real life is peaking, and that's because that's when she was diagnosed. And then the blue line is the model which has pretty well predicted that the cow was actually sick during this time. So um, some other model predictions that we see, um, sometimes it's a good prediction. So here it's when a cow has mastitis, and there's the window here where she was diagnosed, and the model has predicted that well. Um, same in the second graph, it's predicted the sickness right in that window. And then finally on the far right, um, there's actually no sickness um, in the real world, and the model didn't predict that. So that's good, the model is doing a good job. But it doesn't always, have perfect predictions because sometimes the window where the cow is diagnosed was a bit earlier than the model, so the model was a bit delayed. Um, or sometimes the model's a bit early, so maybe the model predicted that um, the illness occurred much before it actually did. So it's not always perfect and it is still a work in progress, but essentially we're finding so far that our models are performing better if we include the behavior data. So that's the rumination and activity. Uh, we're also finding that the model works better if you look at daily variation in the data. So not just what's her milk yield for that whole day, but variation in her milk yield throughout the day. So please stay tuned for more results. So this is everything we've gone through today. Uh, I talked about how herd level lameness lowers production as well as moderate lameness. Uh, I talked about subclinical psychosis and how important rumination data can be to early on show us that a cow is going downhill with a sickness. Also, I talked about how different illnesses can respond different from each other and what else we could consider. So that includes the environment data, what point is the cow at in her lactation, how many lactations she's had, and also what is she doing relative to what her healthy herd mates are doing? And I finished off with talking about ways to improve it. So before we get to questions, I just want to thank you all for signing up for the webinar and to the funding sources I've got from the Canadian government, the Mastitis Network, uh, the Food From Thought Program, the Ontario government, and a big, big thank you to Dairy Farmers of Canada. Thank you.
Excellent, Megan. Thank you very much for that presentation. Really mind blowing, uh, and I think it highlights <laughs> the potential of of all the data that is being captured by, by these systems, and and that I think we are only using a fraction of it. Um, and as we get more into it and using more of it and using better machine learning, deep neural networks or whatever those things end up looking like, I think the potential is is really very big. So I congratulate you for all the hard work um, and, and it, it was indeed an excellent presentation. Surprising to see the picture of January in Canada with the snow on the floor <laughs> when we are melting here in Australia, but that's interesting. That there was a couple of questions that came through. Um, let me open them. So the first one is, hi, Megan, great presentation. Will your algorithms be able to be used across multiple systems or brands? You can still hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So currently, they are working with some Lely-specific data. But there's no reason that you can't include uh, milk, milk yield and conductivity selected by a G Laval or a GIA. And if you want to have that added behavior data, you can install some rumination callers of a different brand. Um, it might be a bit more complicated to feed it all together, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. Excellent. And the other question that is kind of related to, to that question is, how close do you think are the machine or deep learning algorithms to predict various diseases be available to commercial dairy farmers? So, on one hand, um, ours need some work, and so we're going to feed another 60 or 100 farms worth of data into it. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not going to be commercially available sooner because oftentimes software will come out that isn't necessarily validated or maybe the companies have validated internally, um, but you don't, we, I wouldn't necessarily know that. So I think also veterinarians shouldn't have to worry. They're not going to be losing their jobs anytime soon because I think there's quite a bit of work to do to get these algorithms up and running to where people can really trust them. Yeah, and I, and I think that's it, right? this is about kind of enhancing the, 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 the labor and the work people do by using kind of technology data and, and, and kind of some algorithms, but it's not replacing good herdsmen's and, and the work exactly. that's do. Yeah. Yeah. Megan, you, you do a lot of work with commercial farmers. How much data do you think farmers are currently using out of the the amount of data that is collecting, and what do you see as the biggest barrier to using more data? So currently, I think people are actually using quite a lot of the data available to them, and the farmers are the ones who are asking for more, and sometimes bringing their own data into Excel and trying to work with it. So. Um, I think people actually use it quite a bit, and I was happy to see that in, in the people signed up for the webinar. What was the second half of that question, Nico? Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to using more data? Oh, right, right. Um, I think the barrier is time, because obviously people know how to look at it, and there's good farm support for them to know what the software is capable of. I think. It just becomes overwhelming when there's five different task lists and you don't necessarily know how much you can trust the, the alert that you're looking at. Um, and so if you get bombarded with too much, you just kind of start ignoring them. So I think a big barrier yeah. is getting it right. Um, Right, you don't want to flag too many cows that aren't sick, but you also don't want to miss the cows who are sick. There's a really fine line there, and I think it kind of depends on people's personalities. Um, like if you're really, really anal retentive and nervous all the time, you want to check every single cow. I think farmers like that should be able to modify that setting. Whereas if you're more easygoing and you're willing to miss a few things, 
uh, maybe you can adjust the settings and they're not going to be so sensitive to pick up every little thing. How far away do you think of the setting of the system as health alerts from, from what actually can, can be observed on farm? Um, I don't think I'm answering your question right, but I, I think people are saying, you know, it's roughly 80% of what I'm seeing. But you're you're asking like the research translated to the farms? Yeah, and, and like uh, comparing your research and, and, and the thresholds that you showed in those health alerts right. at the beginning. Right. Is it is yeah, it way yeah. different? Like the 40 day or 40 minute rumination trouble? Yeah, yeah. Is it is it 40 or should it be 60 or should it be hundred right I, I mean I think it should be you know almost like 20 but it depends what illness you're looking at right yeah so yeah. Um, I think it, it can't just look at one thing on its own I think the most important thing that researchers in the world are finally getting on top of is putting it all together in a useful way because on its own rumination time could just mean that it was hot yesterday so yeah, the best exactly. way to make it useful is to yeah put it all together. Yeah, so so the data pr provides a lot of information, but you still need the context kind of around it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean a lot of the machine learning is is this black box that you don't know what's happening inside. But I think it's also important to make sure that you're looking at how the farm functions and how does a cow function, and it does need to be meaningful to be useful. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, the, the other question is, you described a move from moving to more describing disease, diseases to more predicting diseases. Do you see a trend towards kind of enabling other actions after the disease is identified? So change feed settings or changing milking permissions after a disease could mm -hmm. be identified? So the coolest thing that I've seen is if you had um, milk BHB and you found out that that cow had ketosis, the robot could automatically give her a glycol pellet or liquid glycol. Um, but I, I think that we're still trying to get to the decision-making stage about what should the human be doing. And I don't even think we're necessarily at the stage of like, what could the robot do to fix this? But I, I definitely think we'll be there in, you know, 10, 10 years or so. Yeah, uh, maybe even so. We don't know. You think so? Oh, I hope so. That would be very exciting. Look, I think the speed of these things is just kind of accelerating as we speak. So I think some of these things that we think are far away are actually not that far away. Yeah. So look, Megan, I, I really want to thank you for for your time. Um, it's been really a pleasure having you on board. Um, as, as I said, it, it's really insightful and inspiring the amount of hard work you're doing and, and, and what the technology can deliver um, and highlighting the importance of, of the farmer or the veterinarian looking at all these to take decisions in the context around all this. So thank you very much for, for your time and your willingness to share all your knowledge with us today. No problem. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So, as with all our webinars, this webinar has been recorded and will become available on the New South Wales TPI Dairy website. We have also a couple of other initiatives that people can join. We've got a Facebook page, New South Wales TPI Dairy, that is followed by more than 1,300 followers from all around the world. Please have a look at that Facebook page. We are having some kind of cool initiatives with some robotic farmers in Australia coming up there soon, some live sessions, some videos, so pe please keep an eye on that. We also have a, a newsletter that comes out four times a year, so subscribe to that if you're not subscribed yet. And the online AMS community where you can answer, qu ask questions or, or contact some experts, please have a look at that too. So feel free to join any of these initiatives. So for more information, I encourage all of you to visit the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries website, where you will be able to access tools and resources about the dairy industry. There is a specific section on precision dairy farming, which includes a lot of the information, not only on robotic milking, but also on different precision farming tools. 
So once again, thank you very much all for joining today and hope to see you the next time.